and the beepers and the noisemakers that you have, we're all plugged in nowadays, and unfortunately they, uh, they make noise and get recorded and it interrupts things. I'm Mike Swetnam, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies for another great forum put together by Yona Alexander. The Potomac Institute is a not-for-profit uh, science and technology policy think tank here in the Washington, D.C. area, and it's been our privilege for more than a decade to sponsor the um, International Center for Terrorism Studies run by Yona Alexander that looks at a full range and spectrum of issues in and around terrorism and world peace. Moreover, it has been our, our privilege and our honor to be associated for most of this time and for many of these events with the International Law Institute. And uh, Professor Don Wallace is here, will we'll, uh, help uh, give a few words uh, in that respect in a few minutes. All of these forums are about trying to find and identify issues and discussion points that can be used as a, a forum for the exchange of ideas and scholarship to help move forward the diplomacy and peace initiatives of our time. Today is an example of that, and as I said a minute ago, we are very proud and privileged to be a part of it. We have also with us today uh, a number of members of the Potomac Institute staff and uh, the chairman of our Board of Regents, General Al Gray, who will have a few words to say in a moment as well. Thank you very much for coming, sir. With that, I'd like to turn the program over to Professor Wallace to kick it off. And, uh, and once again, as I said a minute ago, it's been a real privilege to be associated and partnered with you in sponsoring many of these events. Sir? Mike, thank you very much. Very glad to be here. I don't know what's going to happen to General Gray, but we'll <laughs> hear from him at some point. Um, I'm the chairman of the International Law Institute, and I guess my connection is that Yona and I have worked together for years, and the center, one of the centers which he runs with, um, on legal studies is housed at the Institute. I'm really very happy to, to join, him, join him once again. Um, lots of things together, and Yona asked me to mention one or two of them. As you may know, uh, Yona and his programs are very active with NATO. Uh, we recently had a program, actually uh, it was almost a year ago now, I suppose, in Chinookale, um, and produced this publication for the so-called Partnership for Peace Training Center, which is uh, an impressive place. And as you've noticed recently, Turkey, with all of its, uh, I've lived in Turkey, I've written books on Turkey, with all of its changes, seems to remain a rather steadfast part of NATO. Um, we've done many other things together, Yona and I, and here's a book on sort of the, uh, the future of measures to be taken with respect to terrorism. And this is really Yona's great specialty, as you'll probably hear. Uh, the subject of this program, uh, the title is UN Palestinian Statehood, Political, Legal, Social, Economic, and Strategic Perspectives. As we all know, uh, the Palestinians have made an application, I think it's the PLA, has made an application to the UN, and we'll see in the weeks and months to come what's going to happen to that uh, application. Um, but there are many perspectives on this subject. I just might say a word about strategy, though I'm a law professor and not a strategist. Driving over um, to Boston on 66, I was listening to a program from the United States Institute for Peace on China. And I was thinking, uh, when you think of Asia, you think of China, you think of Japan, you think of Korea, you think of all these countries and in a way, the United States has a rather enviable strategic position out there, notwithstanding the enmity of these countries for each other. Now we come to the Middle East, which is the home of the Palestinians. Uh, I've lived in Turkey. You think of Turkey, you think of Egypt, you think of Iran, you think of Israel. And I'm not so sure we have a similar happy situation there. And I expect that is really one of the great perspectives and backgrounds to this subject, which we're going to deal with today. At this point, I'll turn the mic, or the mics, there are two of them, uh, over to Yona, 
the indefatigable Professor Alexander. Well, I would yield to the no, no. not now? No, yeah, not now. <laughs> okay. No. I would dare speak ahead of uh, Dove and these well, people. I mean, that would be... Uh, that's... Uh, I'm here to make sure he doesn't go to Yeah. Well, thank you. You're on television. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're ready to go. Uh, thank you very much. We want to thank uh, SISPAN for broadcasting uh, this, uh, this event to to bring some of these ideas to a wider uh, audience. Um, I would uh, like to, to welcome the participants uh, here and our very distinguished uh, panel. We'll introduce them properly a little bit uh, later, later on. Um, I want to, to mention also that um, one of our major programs is to train the next generation of scholars and professionals, and I'm very proud to introduce the group that we have now for this uh, semester. Pat, where are you and where is the group? Would you stand up? Would you introduce them quickly? Sure. Um, some of our interns uh, for this semester. Uh, this is the fall program, and uh, if you say your name, your university. University of Philadelphia. Jesse Sadler, Emory University, Atlanta, Georgia. We have uh, in the audience uh, some true experts uh, living with uh, the Middle East for uh, decades, and I'm sure that they will uh, participate uh, actively uh, at our discussion later on. Now, before I introduce uh, our distinguished uh, panel, I would like to make two quick remarks. So one on the personal uh, level, I would like to confess that uh, I was at one time in my life as a child a Palestinian, a Jewish Palestinian during the British mandate. So certainly I have some interest in this issue and then subsequently the establishment of the state uh, of uh, Israel. As a participant observer, we try to follow both from the academic point of view uh, what the situation on the ground uh, is, and uh, actually we can total some 64 years. Although the so-called Palestinian uh, question perhaps is 100 years old, going back to the First World War. Now, um, what I try to do is to prepare a couple maps. I, I wanted to project it, but with some technical problem, but uh, hopefully it was <coughs> distributed. Um, because there is a great deal of confusion. What are we talking about? What does it mean, the Palestinian question? So one, one map uh, deals with the Middle East. In other words, all these terms and concepts, as you know, they originated in Europe, from the European point of view, the Near East, Levant, the Middle East, the Far East, and so on. And it's almost difficult to find a map that does include all the countries uh, in the region, the Arab and the non-Arab countries. Uh, we mentioned, of course, uh, Egypt and, and Jordan and Turkey and, and Israel, but uh, we have a total of 25 countries uh, in the region. And I think we have to include also North Africa and the Maghreb. And in fact, uh, some of the sub-Saharan, like Mauritania and so forth. So uh, in other words, we're dealing with a vast uh, area with uh, great concern with what's happening in the region and the Palestinian uh, question. Now. Another comment, so you do have some of these maps, a general map of the Middle East. You have one map which relates to 1947 UN partition resolution. And you have one map of the current situation, Israel and the Palestinian Authority today. So when you have a chance, uh, I suggest that you look at that. The second uh, aspect that I would like to mention that 
Obviously, the focus today is on the Palestinian-Israeli question. Let me remind all of us that we have to see it also in the broader context, meaning that there are many security challenges uh, in the Middle East. We have a long, long release. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to remind us that you cannot just resolve the so-called Arab-Israeli uh, situation, particularly the Palestinian, without looking at some of the other challenges, particularly when we have the ongoing Arab Spring, such as theological and political radicalization, propaganda, psychological warfare, violations of human rights, internal political and economic dislocations, organized criminal activity, state-sponsored terrorism, non-state terrorism, piracy and maritime threats, development of weapons of mass destruction, <coughs> employment of the energy and water weapon, and finally, regional destabilization. Now, we can learn a great deal from history. This is how the Chinese try to teach us, and the philosopher Ego reminded us that we learn from history that we don't learn from history. Uh, in fact, uh, this month of uh, September uh, marks the 1972 uh, Munich, Munich incident when the Palestinian issue was placed on the world stage. And of course, today we're dealing with the Palestinian state uh, in the United Nations. And obviously, we just marked the 9-11 anniversary. And the key questions, obviously, for the 9-11, as all of us know, is whether the worst is yet to come and whether civilization will survive. Now, when we come to the issue of the current issue of the United Nations Palestinian statehood, I think, number one, as I mentioned before, it does mark the 63rd uh, anniversary of the 64th, if you take the 1947 uh, United Nations Resolution 181, which calls for the establishment of an Arab state, Palestine, and a Jewish state, uh, Israel. So the key question that I think the panel would consider is whether the expectations for the implementation of the 1947 resolution is realistic. And secondly, can we really expect the establishment of a Palestinian state side by side with Israel within a year or within five years or 10 years? Or perhaps we have to wait decades before uh, this plan is going to be uh, realized. So the bottom line is this, is the conflict between so-called enemies is permanent or we have to look at the strategic and interests of the parties, namely that there are no permanent enemies and no permanent friends, but permanent uh, interests. So we have a very distinguished panel today and what I would like to do is to first uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, Mahmoud uh, from uh, Jordan. And I would like to mention that on the personal level, I was honored to have the opportunity to attend the signing of peace uh, between Jordan uh, and Israel in 1994. And following what uh, the king just said at the United Nations, His Majesty Abdullah, he mentioned three main points which I would like to uh, repeat. Uh, one, he was talking about the global justice by peaceful process of law. In other words, this can be achievable. He tried to stress that. The second point, he mentioned that the central crisis is 
the question of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. And the third point that he mentioned at the United Nations is that the two state solution would end that kind of challenge. So with that, I would like to invite his honorable Mahmoud Hamoud, who is the deputy chief of mission at the embassy of Jordan. We distributed to you the bios of the speakers, so I'm not going to go uh, into great uh, details, except to, to mention that he deals specifically with political, legal, and Senate affairs uh, at the embassy. He's also the director of the legal department and advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served uh, at the United Nations and uh, elsewhere, and he received his master's degree from George Washington University uh, Law School and another master's uh, degree uh, from the University of New uh, Amsterdam, and he graduated from the University of Jordan Law School. Uh, he wrote extensively on these uh, issues. I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Professor Yona Alec uh, Alexander and the Columbia Institute for their kind invitation and for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank Professor Don Wallace for introducing this, this important topic, which, of course, uh, now everybody uh, who is involved in uh, global affairs and international affairs uh, is, is following what is happening in the UN. Uh, within the next uh, few weeks, of course, will have a very important implication, not only regionally on the Middle East, but also on uh, several aspects of the world affairs. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, say to uh, Professor Alexander, who also was there during the signing of peace treaty. I was one of those who negotiated the peace treaty with Israel in 1994 and drafted the peace treaty. And it was a very monumental event. Uh, it makes such a difference uh, now uh, that we see what the, you know, the developments in the Middle East has led to. The prospects of peace at that time were so high that everybody was thinking that within a few years, actually, people would have two states, the state of Palestine and the state of uh, Israel, both secure, both living in peace side by side. It will be one peace, will be the peace between uh, not only states and governments, but between peoples. Unfortunately, the developments in the Middle East uh, uh, haven't uh, put forward this uh, goal of the peace process uh, into effect. And it is, you know, people will say, well, who is to blame uh, in this regard? Or, on the, on the stalemate, I think, I think this is not the right uh, question. I think what we all should strive for is try to restore uh, the vision and the hope of peace that uh, eventually one day, hopefully soon, we'll have two states. Uh, one day, hopefully soon, we'll have uh, peace, comprehensive peace in the Middle East that achieves the security and peace for both um, Israel the Palestinians and uh, the rest of the countries in the Middle East. Now, um, the question comes why the you know, Palestinians went to the United Nations. Uh, and what, what would this achieve? Uh, in 1988, uh, the PLO has already declared uh, the creation of Palestinian state. And I think within a couple of years' time, they had like 110 or 120 recognitions. And now I think they have more like 140 recognitions. Um, but that's political declarations create states. That's that's a different matter. And you know, international lawyers know that for a state to be established, you need a territory, you need peoples, and you need uh, an effective government that runs the affairs of the state. 
Now, what happened in the past a couple of years, uh, I think it wasn't uh, productive in pushing the vision forward and trying to have a negotiated solution based on the Oslo Accords and based on the Madrid process. And I think what happened is that Palestinians generally felt that there is not much within the negotiation process that they can depend on to achieve the, their right to self-determination, a right which was actually recognized not only by the United Nations, but most countries in the world. And I think even Israel has recognized the right of self-determination to the Palestinians. Now, the issue where what do you achieve from, from going there? I think what the question should be that what, what would Israel lose by having a Palestinian state declared? The issue, as uh, President Abbas said a couple of days ago, three days ago, when he submitted the application, it's not about Israel. It's about the Palestinians and for them to have a state. And I think it, it achieves a moral, uh, moral value that they are eventually being recognized by the international community through the United Nations as a state, as their right to self-determination has been fulfilled. Now, would this create a state on the, on the ground? It, it would not. It would, be, it would remain an occupied state. And for it to, for the occupation to end, there ha everybody agrees. All those who have stakeholders, including Jordan, the United States, the Europeans, um, the Quartet, that it has to be a negotiated solution. Negotiated solution with a basis which is the 1967 borders. When there was this controversy about the mutual exchange, people thought of, you know, uh, you know well, well, the basis of the 1967 border, and you say, what does that mean? The 242, resolution 242, which was accepted by everybody, including Israel, it says it talks about uh, peace on the basis of uh, exchange, uh, mutual exchange of, of territory. So this is the, 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 the premises. You have the 1967 line, and then you have, uh, you, ex you do the exchange of territory on the basis of what makes both the Palestinians and Israel as uh, secure. Uh, what is happening is that there is critical issues that need to be resolved. And these issues, again, it is by negotiations that uh, can resolve. And the key issue is basically, which was not mentioned in the quartet the other day, is settlements. And this is what led the Palestinians to mainly to go to the United Nations. Settlement is something which effectively destroys any chances of a two-state solution. It is eating lands, and you can, and these are facts, since the, the Oslo Accords till now, the number of settlers and settlements have not only doubled, but tripled and quadrupled. <coughs> and the peace and the lands that can Palestinians have a state on effectively is diminishing day by day. This is the key problem. And if there is a genuine intention to have peace. There has to be a resolution of this, a courageous resolution uh, on part of Israel with regard to the settlements and to deal with the, uh, with the settlers uh, in the settlements. Then there's the issue of, of course, refugees. And uh, President Abbas made it clear the other day, the General Assembly, that there is a Palestinian state when there is a Palestinian state, the issue of the refugees problem will be solved. I'm not going to talk on their behalf, but this gives a very strong signal on how the resolution uh, of the matter would be. Uh, Professor Alexander talked about 181 uh, on the creation of uh, two states, an Arab state and a Palestinian state. And there is, of course, another important resolution with regard to the refugees, which is the GA Resolution 194, which calls for uh, uh, a just uh, settlement uh, for uh, the Palestinian uh, refugees problem. And this is the basis, one of the basis of the Arab Peace uh, uh, Initiative that was presented for. So there is, uh, there is another 
parameter that we can deal with and can be a basis for a solution. That is, 1967 borders, a great solution for the refugee problem, a just solution, and a resolution of, of the issue of the settlements. And that is, can be a mechanism for, for this, including, you know, to agree on uh, borders and security first. Again, it is a negotiated settlement. What the Palestinian UN bid will do, it will not undermine the prospects of negotiated settlement. There is nothing that Israel will lose from the declaration of a Palestinian state as such. It will actually uh, be an incentive for all parties to go forward and to negotiate on the hard issues that um, I, I talked uh, um, about. Uh, it is, uh, again, it is, you know, if you're talking about security, security can be achieved through peace. And the argument basically that it's only one side deserves security and the other side deserves peace doesn't work. It has to be peace and security for both sides. And this is where the two sides can agree on. And then the United States and other stakeholders, including Jordan, including Egypt, including the United Nations, have to support any future solution in, in this uh, regard. Uh, I don't know if. Uh, I want to, uh, do you want me to add anything in, in this? But I'm happy to answer a few que uh, questions later uh, about this. And thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Don't worry. We'll of plenty of questions and, and time. The, the purpose obviously is to develop a, a dialogue. Within a very short period of time, you provided a very broad perspective. And obviously, there, there were hundreds of resolutions of the United Nations, and you were part of it, uh, dealing with different um, uh, aspects. We can go through uh, all of them. But the, the 181 uh, resolution, November 29, 1947, it's critical in a sense that this was the vision of the international community to have two states living in peace side by side. And the question is, how can we uh, realize that? Uh, to, uh, to bring a quote unquote an Israeli, because there are many Israeli views on this uh, issue, uh, we were delighted uh, to have with us uh, Professor uh, Aaron. Perry, you, you have his uh, CV, so I'm not going to go into uh, details, obviously. Uh, currently, uh, is the uh, Abraham and Jack K. Chair in uh, Israel Studies and Director of the Joseph and Alma Gidden Foreign <coughs> Institute for Israeli Studies at the University of Maryland. Uh, again, on a personal and professional level, I was uh, able to follow his, uh, his work uh, as an academic, uh, as well as a political advisor to Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin. And um, he set up uh, some very important um, institutes, such as uh, the Institute of Media, Politics, and Society. He was a professor of sociology and communication uh, at Tel Aviv University. He was teaching uh, in Jerusalem. <coughs> And he was uh, editor in chief of the Israeli Daily Devar. I can go on and on. Uh, he was educated at uh, Hebrew University and received his PhD at London School of uh, Economics. Um, in addition to his uh, academic work, uh, he was a very prominent journalist and political uh, commentator. And in fact, uh, during the uh, Golda Meir's uh, terms, prime. A minister was a spokesman of the uh, Labour Party. It was a different <coughs> Labour Party than it is today, but at any rate. And he published extensively um, on many of uh, the issues that we're going to deal with. So, Yaron, please, it's all yours. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yona. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this interesting meeting. It's the first time that I'm 
participating in this institute, and it looks very impressive. I'm sure I'll have more time after that to learn more about it. Uh, like my two predecessors, I participated as well at the, conf at the peace uh, the treaty, the signing of the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan uh, in the Arava, but I was also in Washington when the peace, not peace, but the recognition, mutual recognition of Israel and the PLO was done by Arafat and, and Rabin. And during these years, I was much more optimistic. So to answer your first question, although your bottom line, is the conflict permanent, using your term, or not, that, that during that time, I was sure it will be over within 10 years. Today, I'm not so sure that it will be over within 10 years. I didn't lose yet my optimism, but I'm afraid it will take more time. And unfortunately, I'm afraid it will need few rounds of violence before we reach an agreement. But let me start uh, more systematically by answering three questions. One, why have the Palestinians decided to go to the UN? And why Israel was against it? B, what happened last week at the UN? That's the second question. And the third question, what will happen in the near future, namely the next year or so? And the advantage that I have over you, Hamoud, is that I'm not representing an official position, so I can be critical on all sides, not only on, on the other side, but also on the Israeli position. Uh, so why did the Palestinians decide to go to the UN? According to the, to the Palestinian leader, Abu Mazen, it was very simple, to continue the negotiation on the diplomatic domain. The direct negotiations did not reach anything, and therefore we are changing our strategy, we are moving it, we are moving into the diplomatic arena to continue the negotiations. This is what he wrote at the UN article, at the, at the New York Times article some time ago. Others would say, and this is the Israeli, most of the Israelis' position, well, it's not the continu the, to continue the negotiations, it's instead of negotiations. It's to use advantages to do to, which will be given to the Palestinians if they move to the UN that they don't have today. And there's a third school of thought in Israel that will say, no, it's not to negotiate at all. It's instead of negotiations. Abu Mazan has decided not to negotiate because of the changes in the Middle East, because time works for us, the Palestinians. Why should we negotiate? We should have more patience and we'll get what we want without negotiations. So these are the three alternative uh, answers. <coughs> I would guess that most of the Israelis, or the official position of the Israeli government, is the second one. The, 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 the UN enterprise has to replace, was, was done to replace negotiations. So why did Israel uh, have a very strong, the Israeli government had a very strong position, position against it? The, uh, the first answer, which you, I'm sure you all know, because that was heard from any, any platform, was that peace can be achieved only through negotiations between the two sides without preconditions. And the Palestinians are presenting preconditions, and they want to conclude an agreement without negotiations, and therefore it cannot be done. There's a more sophisticated answer to that, which some people mention, but not all of them, uh, not, in, not in all no, not in all debates which I heard or participated in Washington, at least. And that is that if you decide to move to the UN and to establish a Palestinian state through the UN process, you, you, you decide to uh, ignore, not only to ignore, to abandon the land for peace solution. After all, the basis of the relations between Israel and the Palestinians was the idea of land for peace. If the Palestinians are getting, even if it's symbolically, are getting a state, namely the land, without negotiating, then why should there be negotiations anymore? So what you are left with, the other solution, either it all will be mine or all will be yours. But the idea of land for peace cannot be pursued anymore. And without, the, 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 without that, uh, you, you lose really the, the, the basis for negotiations and for conclusion. Then you can ask, you can say, there's another reason why Israel decided not to go, and that is, of course, because the situation in the Middle East has changed, and Israel has become weaker with the, with the geostrategic new conditions, 
and the Israelis feel that to negotiate today might put them under much more pressure than they were in the past. And you will have the fourth position that some Israelis accept, that is that Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, doesn't want to negotiate. And there are some Israelis, there was a demonstration a week ago, who argued that Netanyahu is using different reasons for no negotiations, because really, in, deep in his heart, he doesn't want to negotiate. And Israel should accept the, the PLO, the, the, the PA uh, initiative, and, and support the creation of the state. Again, that's, that school of thought is a very small. The majority of the Israelis believe that uh, the position that the state, that the government says, namely that we, you cannot reach an agreement without negotiations, particularly not without, particularly not if you have preconditions. And the whole issue of settlements suddenly became a precondition. For 20 years, we did negotiate, reach agreements without this precondition. Why is it now on the table? It only shows that the Palestinians have uh, changed their position and they are using the settlements today, which they did not for the last 20 years. So what happened last week in the UN? Uh, well, it is clear that both uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abu Mazen spoke, spoke mainly to domestic audiences. That was the first target, to, to talk to the domestic audiences. Indeed, they were very successful. Both uh, changed their position dramatically. Netanyahu came back home, and the public opinion polls today are more supportive of him than they were two weeks ago. And Abu Mazen is now recognized as his real leader, unlike the the image that he had before that. So they were successful in doing that. Would that bring us closer to peace? I'm not sure, because the second outcome of the, of the last week um, talks at, in, in New York were widening the gap between the two positions. Each one of the two added more elements, more ingredients to the, pos the original position that was a month ago, a month earlier. The Israelis, everybody, were furious with the, with the speech of Abu Mazen, who, who, who spoke about Christianity and, and the Islam world, or, or the Christian, Christian and, and Muslim attachment to the Holy Land, and he didn't mention the Jews. And he spoke about Israel and the entire state of Israel, not only the occupied territories, those who were, who were occupied in 67. This, this, if you compare this speech to pr speeches earlier, he moved far away from these values. And I'm sure that some, some pro-Palestinian supporters will say that Netanyahu did the same. So both, both sides moved to took positions or added more elements that were not there earlier. So definitely we did not come closer. Well, the good story, the good news, is that the confrontation was prevented. Uh, for, uh, Defense Minister Barak spoke about tsunami in the UN. Well, there was no tsunami in the UN. And uh, the, the um, Security <coughs> Council started yesterday discussing in the, in the subcommittee the proposition put forward by the Palestinians. It might take weeks, might take months, so it will ease a little the tension. And there was the quartet proposition that was put on the table that can be discussed in the future, which I guess you all know. So the tension, the, the, the build up to a dramatic, to a drama was, seemed to be not as frightening as it is. Things went down. So what will happen in the near future? Well, I don't think that, the, that uh, much can happen in the near future. I don't believe that, as uh, Yona, you asked us, where the Palestinian state will be established in the near future, not in the next year. I don't think that uh, the timetable that the Quartet put to the, to the sides will, will be, no one will be able to fulfill that. I believe that uh, the calls for the renewal of the negotiations, it will be very difficult to do that. And if it will be done, it will be done just for public opinion or public diplomacy, not seriously. Uh, so the Palestinians will bring their call to the US, uh, to the UN uh, General Assembly, and probably will get a majority there. But uh, it will be only symbolic achievement, symbolic act. So I, I think that the, in the next year, things will continue as they are, as they were in the last year. Um, the year 12, 
2012 will be a, a transition period. Don't forget that you are very you are getting closer and closer to elections in the United States, which will play a role. And uh, I don't see m much change in the near future unless one thing does happen. And in the Middle East, that can happen within minutes. Remember the last war in Lebanon. If there are, if the violence starts, a peaceful Palestinian demonstration could very easily turn into a violent demonstration. An Israeli soldier will have to fire. And that the, the genie will come out of the bucket. Or a provocation by Israeli uh, extreme settlers. So, so the, the, the transformation from a violence, from a low key into a drama could be very easy. If that doesn't happen, I believe that uh, the next year think there will be more talks and we'll be able to meet here again after the elections in the United States to ask in what way the new American president or the old American president or the renewed American president can support the process to get forward. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Yaram, uh, for an Israeli view, not official. Uh, and uh, as I said, um, our, our mission is uh, to learn the lessons of, of history and to try to anticipate the future. So as we say, inshallah, after the elections, we'll meet again and we'll see what can be done. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dov Zatheim uh, is, I'm sure, a familiar figure, if I may use this term, uh, in uh, Washington. And um, he uh, currently is a senior advisor to CSIS and uh, senior fellow at the CNAC Corporation. And uh, previously, he served as a senior vice president of who's uh, Ellen Hamilton. <coughs> and I think um, is uh, very well known uh, for many of his uh, contributions. Uh, one of them, the Under Secretary of Defense and Chief uh, Financial Officer of the Department of, uh, of Defense. Um, now, uh, obviously, as a very uh, long list of accomplishments, and uh, as I mentioned, you can uh, read it. Um, but what is really important, uh, you, you looked at some of the uh, key challenges to the United States, Afghanistan, uh, and, uh, and Iraq, uh, dealing with some of these issues. Uh, I met him, uh, I think, in the late uh, 70s, early uh, 80s uh, at CSIS. Uh, he graduated from uh, Columbia University uh, initially, and then uh, he studied in London, the London School of Economics, and received a PhD uh, actually at uh, Oxford uh, University. And uh, he served academically also as a, as a professor at a number of institutions, including the National War College, uh, Shiva University, Columbia, Trinity College, and so on. I would like to mention only one book, uh, the most recent uh, book, that I got, uh, the, a book on tale, how the Bush administration managed reconstruction of Afghanistan, uh, just was published uh, several uh, months months ago. And uh, obviously, uh, Dov is a uh, frequent uh, commentator on the radio, TV, and media in general. Dov, please. <coughs> Thanks very much, Yona, and uh, it's good to be here. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge my good friend General Al Gray, who's sitting in the front row, who uh, was one of the most dynamic commandants the Marine Corps has ever had. Al and I go back longer than either of us will admit, uh, but uh, I certainly am proud that I can call him a friend. Um, like Yoram, uh, I'm not going to speak for this administration. Anybody who knows me will understand why I wouldn't. Um, but I do want to give a sense of 
at least where the national security community in, in this town uh, stands and is looking at things. And, and I want to start with the largest possible context and work my way down to uh, the subject of, uh, of the UN and, and the Palestinian application. The largest context, frankly, is that we would like to look somewhere other than the Middle East. We have been swamped by the Middle East for a decade. We're getting out of Iraq. You can debate whether we should have gone in or not. Uh, that's irrelevant. We've been there. And the real question is, when we get out, what will Iraq look like? Uh, will it be a Wilsonian democracy? Nobody says that. Uh, will it absorb American resources? It might. It already has, to a huge extent. But we'll have a relationship. We're about to sell them F-16, so there's a change there. But there are other parts of the world that have been de literally demanding our attention for quite some time. Just think about it. For a start, there's Europe. Nobody pays much attention to Europe until there's a huge crisis with the EU, and all of a sudden, on top of our economic crisis, this could be a massive disaster. And so you have our Treasury Secretary going out and meeting with the Eurozone people and trying to give them advice at the same time as, as he's trying to deal with them real big economic problem back home. So Europe's on our agenda. East Asia is on our agenda. We do talk about China and think about China and are not sure how to relate to China. Latin America is, a, is increasingly on our agenda, primarily because of Brazil, but not only because of Brazil. When you add that to domestic concerns and you recognize, as anybody who's been in government recognizes, that we have a hard time walking and chewing gum at the same time, you begin to realize why the Middle East is not a place that we would like to continue to focus on endlessly, say, for the next decade, as we have for the past decade. Then there's the context of the Middle East itself. I've already mentioned Iraq. But there's so much more. Where is the Arab Spring headed? I was talking to an Arab foreign minister just on Sunday who says, well, we're in autumn now. It's still going on. Not too many things have been resolved even in Tunisia, which in many ways is the easiest one to resolve. They're still fighting in Libya. We don't know whether Libya will turn into a kind of Iraq vintage 2005, 2006. We just don't know. Yemen, President Saleh's back. How does that play out? Who knows? Syria, everybody knows about it. Everybody worries about it. Not too much talk about it. Meanwhile, President Assad keeps on killing his own people. How will that play out? Who knows? Then there are the GCC states, terrified of, of any kind of upheaval in Bahrain. Those troops have not left Bahrain yet, in Saudi and Emirati, police as they're called, Saudi and Emirati police. Terrified of Iran, Saudi Arabia terrified of Yemen. Lots of terror, not terror in your classic sense, Yona, but terror in terms of just pure fear in, in the region. And then Israel and Egypt. We're talking about Israel and Palestine, but what about a situation where, after so many years of peace and quiet, the, the embassy is practically overrun in, in, in Cairo? And who knows when the Israeli ambassador will ever come back to Egypt? And you know, you can worst case that, even though there have been reassurances coming out of Cairo to Jerusalem. And then, of course, Turkey. And you've seen the latest round. Pres uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has now shot back at President er uh, Erdogan. I mean, Prime Minister Erdogan, but that's, that is not a recipe for, for happiness, let's put it that way. And so you've got complications there. So even within the Middle East, the peace process is just a part of a huge whole. Well then, you might say in that case, maybe the peace process isn't all that important to the United States. And there are, and I've said this before in other locations, uh, there certainly are Israeli policymakers who think that if you wake an American policymaker up at 2 in the morning, they will admit to you that the peace process is not that important. And they are dead wrong. Because whatever you might think of the merits of the peace process, it is probably the single highest priority we have in the Middle East. Whether it should be or not, again, is immaterial. I believe that is what it is. And that is why General Petraeus has said what he said. And that's why former Secretary of Defense Gates has said what he said, because that is the national security community's view. Why is it its view? 
not because they think that a deal between Israel, which is relatively small, and Palestine, which is even smaller, is going to solve the, the, the troubles of a region that, as Yona pointed out, is huge. No, but it'll ease them. And anything that is easing the difficulties, particularly of our allies, and particularly of those in the GCC, and anything that allows the GCC to work more closely with Israel against Iran is something that is a huge priority for us. So there's another point as well, which is not often stated, but no one has ever accused me of being a diplomat, and I don't think I ever will be one. I think there is a perception. No, I know there's a perception in the national security community that Israel, over the long term, is getting strategically weak. There's a huge concern about that. It's not because people are anti-Israel. On the contrary, it's because people are pro-Israel and don't want to see Israel become strategically weaker. There is a sense that it's becoming weaker relative to its neighbors. It's becoming weaker relative to what might happen on the Arab street and with Arab Spring. And finally, it might become weaker simply because our interests in this country are less congruent with Israel's interests than they were 20 years ago than they were, say, when uh, the Oslo Treaty was signed. It's not that they're totally divergent, but they're less congruent. And that's important as well. Now, turning to the Palestinian application, of course we're going to beat them. The Palestinians know it. Everybody knows it. We've said it. There's no way we can back off. In fact, if we did back off and didn't veto, we would destroy our credibility not only with Israel, but with the Arabs. As it is, our credibility in the Arab world is pretty crummy because they see that we cut a deal with Gaddafi, threw him under the bus. We allowed Mubarak to be thrown under the bus. Whether that's true or not, I don't care. That's the perception in the region. And of course, we, threw, we allowed the Shah to be thrown under the bus. And people in that part of the world, correct me if I'm wrong, sir, have very long memories. And so they remember. And People are saying, well, there's a pattern here. And if we throw the Israelis under the bus, no one will believe us about anything. So we're going to have to beat up. But having said that, uh, what does the Palestinian objective, what helps the Palestinian objective by going through the motions for a veto? I'm not sure. Other than prompting negotiations, maybe not the way it's been described, but simply getting people moving off the dime. There is a perception in the region uh, and a perception in this town that perhaps the administration could have been more forceful. And it, it expresses itself in a variety of ways. It's interesting that Mr. Obama has yet to visit Israel. If it's such a high priority for him, why hasn't he gone there yet? Um, ha has he done anything like Mr. Clinton did in terms of uh, shuttle diplomacy or Camp David diplomacy? The answer is no. Uh, Mrs. Clinton is now heavily engaged, but for a long time she wasn't. There was a series of people who basically had the mandate to negotiate on behalf of the United States, but they weren't senior enough. Or, as in the case of Dennis Ross, anybody knew him. So it was same old, same old. Well, if you're trying to get a deal going, same old, same old doesn't necessarily work. And Dennis is a very talented fellow, but he's been there and he's done that over and over and over again. So. If this prompts a really intensive effort on the part of the United States and the Quartet, <clears throat> you know, then all of a sudden you're talking about an opportunity. But at the same time, the Palestinians have to make sure that they don't make life so complicated that, they, that the opportunity is blown. For example, the settlements issue. I've heard Abu Mazen personally say, well, you know, what do you expect from us? It was the American administration that started the settlements thing. And, that boxed me into a corner, perhaps. But at the same time, if you focus on you know, settlements to the point where somebody just had a baby and wants to build an extra bedroom and that's going to hold up peace in the Middle East, that's nuts. I mean, it's just stupid. If you want to say don't build major settlements, don't start any more outposts, there'd be huge sympathy in this country for that. But don't build another bedroom? Is that going to turn the tide of the Middle East? We give me a break. Uh, another complication. You can't go and say, well, once we have an independent Palestine, Jews won't be able to live there. Because that sets off all kinds of emotions. Because the last people who said that were the Nazis. And if you want to get American support, 
to push a peace deal and to put some pressure on the Israelis, you don't say stuff like that. The Palestinian officials have. Not very smart. <coughs> um, what to do about Hamas? As long as Hamas says they don't want to recognize Israel, you're giving the Israelis an excuse not to cut a deal. The Palestinians have to come up with some kind of formula how they're going to deal with Hamas in a way that it doesn't railroad this kind of deal that they really want. And so obviously that's a PA challenge. And finally, assuming, which I think is a safe assumption, that things don't get past the Security Council, so they go to the General Assembly, and if they want to get a negotiation based on having some kind of status that's granted to them by the General Assembly, and you know it's difficult to argue against that, will that include being able to sue the Israelis in the International Criminal Court, International Court of Justice? Because you can't expect people to negotiate with you if you're branding them criminals. That's not going to work. It didn't work for the Israelis when they branded the Palestinians criminals. It's not going to work the other way either. So there are certain challenges for the Palestinians as well, just like there are for the Israelis. Now, as for the timing of the quartet, you could argue that this will never happen, that it's fanciful. You could also argue that if you've got actually the quartet on the same page, and remember, the EU, to get the EU on the same page is pretty phenomenal. And I think if you speak to EU foreign ministers, as I have, they're pretty proud of the fact that they pulled that one off. Um, you now have an awful lot of very powerful, economically powerful countries pulling in the same direction. Plus, the Russians may not be as economically powerful, but still very influential, and trying to get something to go in a year. Now, will it happen in a year? I think Mr. Obama has a tremendous incentive to make it happen in a year. He's clearly uh, appealing to his own base. He considers the Jewish community in this country part of his base. And the latest polls that have been taken show that by 48 to 45 percent, American Jews think Obama's not doing a good job. When was the last time you saw a poll like that? If I were sitting in the White House advising the president, I'd be nervous. So he has an incentive, actually, to make this quartet thing work. And it might. I don't know. But if it does, then he has to deal with the other side, which is the Congress. And of course, everybody talks about Congress as if we Republicans dominated both houses. We actually don't. We only have one house right now, uh, the House of Representatives. But it's clear that the sympathy for Mr. Netanyahu and the support for Israel in the Congress is exceedingly strong. So the deal would have to be one that Israel can live with. Otherwise, you wind up with not only divided government, but with mixed signals to the region. And historically, when the United States sends mixed signals to the region, it doesn't work out well. So there are quite a few challenges here. I'm not going to do it with uh, Professor uh, Perry did and, or, or Yona and make predictions as to what will happen. Can better things happen? I think they can. There are lots of pressures in that direction. Can people make mistakes along the way? Absolutely. Obviously, uh, all the speakers uh, provoke a lot of uh, or trigger a lot of uh, issues and questions will come back to it. But uh, before, we would like to invite uh, Ambassador uh, Ed, uh, Ed Marks uh, to expand a little bit on uh, the uh, concerns, the interests of the uh, international community. Uh, it was already uh, referred to whether it's uh, the, uh, the EU, obviously the UN, uh, NATO, and some of the other organizations and um, fundamentally is there a role for diplomacy uh, in this particular uh, issue and uh, how do you see the, uh, the steps in the coming months uh, and years? Well, one more, one more word. I mean, uh, again, on a personal level, as well as professionally, it is uh, uh, indeed, um, a pleasure, uh, an honor, and all that. And I, I think, in terms of the bridges between the academic community, uh, government goes uh, all the way back, and we were able to mobilize you to participate in many, many of the activities uh, over over the years, and uh, particularly when you know you were the deputy ambassador at large at the department of the state the counterterrorism uh, issues. And uh, since uh, you retired, obviously, we, we tried to 
bring you back into the fold. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Yona, as always, very generous. Uh, first, I'd like to note, uh, for those who've managed to look at the bios, you may have noticed that my bio is extremely short compared to my colleagues. There are two reasons for that. <coughs> One, I was been traveling and I forgot to send them even my puffed up bio. The other reason is the obvious one, that my colleagues have a much richer and more distinguished background than I do. But I want to note to you the brevity of my bio because I don't want anybody to jump to the conclusion, which is common in this town, that actually I was with CIA, not with the Foreign Service. <laughs> <laughs> not true. Uh, last week, um, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas formally asked the United Nations to accept the Palestine as a member state. In doing so, he, so to speak, returned to the scene of the crime, as in 1947, when Britain was the dominant power in Palestine, both Arabs and Jews contested, were opposed to British rule, and Arabs and Jews struggled for dominance in the region, in the country. The UN resolution of November 29, 1947 was intended to provide a peaceful change to that situation with the redistribution of power by terminating British control on the one hand and partitioning the territory between the Arabs and Jews on the other. That event was clearly in an historic sense, a culmination of long-term changes that have been going on in the world ever since the Westphalian treaties, in particular the spread of nationalism, the concept of nationalism, which had grown and well beyond the original participants in the treaties. Um, in the 19th century, nationalism was a major cause of conflict in the international world, cause of many numerous conflicts between self-identified groups, nationalities, and foreign powers. By the end of World War I, the national principle had pretty much been accepted by everybody. It was surely enshrined in the covenant of the League of Nations. And with that, the dissolution of the European colonial powers began, although it took another generation or two. Both Zionism and Palestinian nationalism, therefore, are rather old-fashioned traditional nationalism casting themselves in the 19th century mode of opposing, of trying to achieve national independence on one hand and opposing foreign domination on the other. In passing the 1947 resolution, the General Assembly <coughs> assumed the mission contained in Article 19 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, the responsibility and task of providing a legal avenue, a legal avenue for the resolution of, of conflict and for obtaining peaceful change in the nation state system. However, it ran across problems. Any recommendation for change acceptable to all parties is essentially superfluous. I mean, it will happen. However, a, a recommendation opposed by one of the parties concerned either means a dead letter or requires enforcement. Enforcement in the UN system means the action by the Security Council, if it is willing and if it is able. This situation was quite accurately described in 1945, right after the creation of the UN by no other than John Forster Dulles, who noted these two characteristics. And, quote, the General Assembly is charged, among other things, to recommend measures for the peaceful adjustment of any situation likely to impart, to impact the general welfare or friendly relations among nations. He then added, the role of the Security Council is predominantly negative. Its task is to stop the nations from public brawling. Mm -hmm. However, the 47 GA recommendation not being acceptable to one of the parties, and the Security Council proving unable or unwilling to enforce the recommendations, in other words, to stop the public brawling, we have had generations, decades of conflict ever since. All during this period, many outsiders, many other countries, have attempted to assist in finding a solution to the conflict, most notably the United States, but without much success, as has been commented on in, in an extensive detail by my colleagues here, and the Palestinians have now decided to seek a new intermediary and have gone back to the United Nations. In doing so, they have clearly decided, at least at this point in time, 
The Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot be resolved direct, except directly by the two protagonists. In fact, can, excuse me, cannot be resolved directly by the two protagonists. This despite the fact that for some time now the two-state solution has become the accept, accepted solution in principle. I emphasize in principle by the two primary parties. Despite this general agreement in principle, achieving agreement has become the most prominent example today in the world of a situation where the devil is indeed in the details. But the new initiative, in a sense, can only return the situation to that of the immediate post-1947 era, in the sense that it will require a Security Council resolution, and it is clear that if nothing else, the United States will veto the resolution. Therefore, even a decision in the General Assembly will once again produce a recommendation challenged by one of the parties without the possibility of enforcement by the other party, by any other party or, point or stakeholder. The alternatives remain what they have been, in other words, for decades, either a negotiated settlement between the two or continued conflict. I uh, will not attempt to make any projects prediction of what which that would be. That's already been done better and more authoritatively by my colleagues here on the panel. Um, however, I'd like to talk a little bit about the other players in this situation, because if we don't, if we even get a negotiated settlement, or others will continue to assist, whether that is meaningful or not is an interesting question. Uh, the history of outside involvement has not been encouraging. <coughs> Foremost among, this was the United States, and Ambassador Abba Iban in 1983 made a description of that situation that I think is probably still valid. He said, quote, there's nothing in the international system quite similar to the relationship between the United States and Israel, given an enormous disparity of power and influence between the two partners. And he went on to say, from the moment of its active entry in the domain of Middle Eastern politics, the United States carried on its shoulders a consciousness of responsibility for the outcome of the Zionist enterprise. I think that description remains essentially valid, although I'm not sure everybody here would agree. Although e Israel's economic and military success over the years has somewhat diminished the disparity between the two in this situation, and consequently increased to some degree Israel's sense of independent action. At the same time, there have been two developments that affect the United States in its role in this. One, the end of the Cold War produced somewhat of an increase in U.S. global influence, U.S. global role. At the same time, the increasingly partisan Nick character of the American domestic foreign dialogue, uh, dialogue on foreign affairs has narrowed the scope of American administrations to act. Public positions, for instance, taken recently by all the Republican candidates for president made it quite clear that unequivocal support for the president's Israeli government is a sine qua non for any American government. Despite the presence of J Street and uneasiness among many American Jews, the unequivocal opposition to any significant American initiative in this situation is now clear, led by most American Jews, the Republican opposition, and the evangelical groups who have made support for Israel almost a matter of faith. As a result, President Obama's effort to revive the peace process by an independent initiative quickly became a dead letter, and he's now reached a state where he's just promised to veto, regardless of the situation, regardless of conditions, <coughs> and the initiative in the Security Council. He made a point, in fact, of stating in his GA speech that peace between the Israelis and Palestinians was only possible with direct negotiations, not by any UN declaration. So even the U.S. now officially takes the position that only direct negotiations can resolve the problem, and all outsiders, including the United States, are essentially note takers. Now, at the same time, we've been involved in the quartet, and there's some hope that it might do something. But uh, in response to the Palestinian initiative, the quartet effort to resolve, to draft a compromise, which might avoid the conflict and the veto in the Security Council, has been rejected by Mr. Obas, and whether the which way and whether even the future of the quartet will exist is an interesting proposition with, this, with the vote coming, with, because the vote on that in the Security Council might well break up the quartet. Um, please excuse me if I appear unduly cynical, but it has struck me for years that most countries in the Middle East, 
with regard to the situation, would really just prefer that it went away. Support for the Palestinians varies, of course, from people to people, from government to government, leader to leader. But since the dramatic wars of some decades ago, the majority appear more or less limiting themselves to essentially pro forma support. The Egyptians and Jordanians went as far as concluding formal peace treaties with Israel. The Syrians played games seeking unilateral advantages. The Saudis preach, among other things, support for the two-state solutions. And the Gulf states say as little as possible, as rarely as possible. The two possible game changers in the area, of course, are the two new emerging regional powers, Iran and Turkey. It is interesting to note that neither are Arab. Nevertheless, the changes they are going through have obvious significant implications. One of the other striking aspects of this development is that both were governments with, who for long periods conducted very close and intimate relations with Israel. Iran under the Shah conducted a very, very close bilateral relationship, including military relations, although quickly abandoned with the Islamic Revolution more than 30 years ago. The current is Iranian reach for regional predominance has caused them to adopt the Palestinian cause quite, quite openly, quite dramatically, which combined with the alleged nuclear weapons program has made them the top, put them to the top of the Israeli worry list. However, the Iranian interest in the issue does not appear to focus on a two-state res resolution, and it's doubtful that they would support that to any degree. The shift in Turkish policy in relation to the Israeli is recent and dramatic, arising from the events connected with the Turkish organized flotilla trying to ram the Gaza blockade. I don't know about others, from my point of view, I, I, it's difficult for me to tell which was cause and which was effect. In any case, in the obvious bid for Middle East relationship, the Turkish Prime Minister has suggested and argued there's a new change of spirit in the Middle East and that Turkey intends to play a prominent role. At this difficult moment, it is difficult to tell how far Turkey will go, both in pursuit of this and in its relations with Israel. I'm not going to say much about the Europeans. Their role over the years has not been very brilliant. From being early and fervent supporters of Israel, they've moved to much more nuanced positions reflecting changes in public opinions, particularly the reversal of role as the Palestinians have increasingly been seen by many as the underdog, reversing the situation of the era of movies like Exodus. A widespread shift in, this, in, in the public perception has certainly produced great changes in, in public and governmental attitudes. On the other hand, the Europeans have been relatively enthusiastic members of the so-called quartet. It'd be interesting to see how that turns out. Mentioning the question of the cartel, of course, brings up the subject of Russia. At best, a minor player still sitting at the table because of its former global glories. But it's difficult to see how its actions today has much more than mischievous dabbling uh, with no intent or ability to play a more active or constructive role. Important question, however, has been the role of non-state actors. Over the years, the question has become increasing of interest to many United States actors, particularly a group of humanitarian NGOs on one hand and political movements in, in the Middle East on the other. The humanitarian NGOs have played a significant role in the, in the growing change of attitude towards the respective relationship between Israelis and the Palestinians, particularly in, 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 in fostering the increasing view of the Palestinians as the underdog. Um, more dramatic has been the role of non-state political organizations willing to use violence, in other words, the terrorist groups. Here we have two distinct varieties, the Palestinian group as, such as Hamas, who see the use of violence as essential to their mission, their objection, obje objective, which is the elimination of Israel. Others, such as Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda, have taken on the Palestinian causes, really as conscious political decisions. To the degree this the position is determined by honest sympathy and real concern, or by deliberate political calculation, I will leave to others to judge. Meanwhile, um, the mainline groups that comprise the Palestinian Authority now seek a two-state political solution and have largely abandoned violent tactics. However, failure to achieve a political settlement could, of course, as been noted, lead to a return to violence even by those groups. The rest of the world are basically onlookers, no real role, uh, lots of stuff in article, and lots of articles in their papers, occasional speeches in the UN, but they're basically onlookers and play no significant role. And left, of 
course, we get to actual votes in the UN, where votes by all these other countries, particularly if they produce a significant majority in the GA for the statehood measure, will obviously have some effect on members of the Security Council, world politics being what they are. Um, but there's one other aspect of, of the changing attitude in the world which is causing serious concern in Israel and among its supporters and should to all of us. International pressure on Israel to end the occupation grows, grows daily. And in the minds of some, this is tied to questioning the very existence of Israel itself. A growing concern for this trend, sometimes called the delegitimization of campaign, is souring the mood of the Israeli public and therefore leading to a diminished ability of Israeli governments to negotiate. While most people and governments around the world continue to make a clear distinction between support for the Palestinian, a Palestinian state and Israel's right to exist, many in Israel, the people who have someone has said in a different context, have too much history and too much of that tragic, do not see it that way. And while it is true that Israel often appears to be paranoid, it is useful to remember that even paranoids can have enemies. <laughs> and in conclusion, I have to make the unremarkable comment that most while onlooker, onlookers lack the power to determine or resolve or facilitate seriously this issue, they never, nevertheless, can exert influence to complicate it for both parties. In either case, whether intended or not, the Israel-Palestinian initiative at the UN and the resulting Israeli and American response that made it clear that the issue is now clearly and solely in the hands of the two parties. Perhaps it was always so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ed, and I, I may know that um, one, one article that uh, just published in the importance of peace uh, relates to NATO's uh, response to, to terrorism, uh, in, in other words, NATO from regional security provider is moving, as we can see, to a global security provider uh, in uh, not only Afghanistan, in Libya, and so forth. At any rate, um, the, the speakers uh, raised some very uh, critical, very important uh, issues, uh, both historical and contemporary. And we would like to develop uh, some sort of uh, discussion. Before we do, we, we have to, to give the, the podium to the general, perhaps to begin to kick off this discussion. General? You want to? Any questions? Yeah, I think the audience has uh, really had enough talk and, and wants to get into this uh, fray. So why don't we just uh, open it up for questions? Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Please. Yeah, you. We have a microphone available. My name is Rafi Ali. I'm with the Memory Middle East Media Research Institute. I noticed the speakers have touched on the political and historical issues and relationship between the Palestinians and the Israelis. No one, unfortunately, touched on the economic dimensions of the conflict. Yet, as the two sides feud, there are certain economic realities being created in the field. Uh, for example, the growth of Palestinian investments in Israel, the economic integration of the very troubles between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Is it possible that we may have some kind of economic integration as a prelude to some kind of political solution? Thank you. Uh, I know that's the uh, dream of a lot of people in the Israeli right. Push off the economic, the political decisions and keep hoping that the economics will make people fat and happy. I'm from the left. No? I'm, I'm, I didn't say what you were. I'm just saying that that is the dream for people on the right, in particular. Uh, look, th there's certainly no doubt that uh, the uh, West Bank is doing exceedingly well with gross domestic product growth that matches anybody in the world right now. Coming off a low base, but still very, very impressive. Very, very, you know, that's, that's like China. I mean, it's very impressive, I agree. Uh, I think, in part, that also may have motivated Abu Mazen. 
because on the one hand there is this political impulse that uh, is almost divorced from economic reality. If you think about Hamas's behavior uh, after the pullout from Gaza where they destroyed all sorts of economic infrastructure that would have created a much more <coughs> comfortable life for their own people and they did it for political reasons. Uh, and so sometimes the politics and the economics overlap perfectly. Sometimes they operate at cross purposes. And it may well be that uh, to some extent there will be a willingness to uh, take uh, economic risks, that is to say, create discord, which will certainly harm the uh, Palestinian econo economy on the West Bank, in order to achieve political objectives. And it's just the reality, history has proved that over and over again. Remember, Britain and Germany were each other's biggest trading partners before World War I. That doesn't seem to have stopped them. May I just sentence? Yes, please. Just one sentence. The, the idea of uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Fayyad was to do to build this new state from the bottom. And people do not uh, see the difference between the economic field and the political field, or institutionalization of the political process on one hand, and the economic development on the other. He, he gained a, a fantastic uh, way by building institutions. So the, 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 the state building process was done in a very careful and, and thorough and successful way. I'm not so sure about the economics, particularly that the huge economic development of the West Bank is due to foreign investment, but not so much investment as foreign money that flows into, into, into the region. So I won't build on the economic development of the West Bank to become to, be, to become a state on the way, while the political institutions are really stronger as well. Any other comments from the panel? <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, uh, just a just a footnote. I, I think with the Arab Spring and the uh, instability, the uncertainty about the future, I think there is a common ground uh, between uh, Israel and Egypt and Jordan and Turkey, and that is tourism security. Uh, meaning these countries uh, obviously are very much interested in making sure that this particular sector of the economy is viable. And the only way to deal with that is to improve security. So I think this gives the parties an opportunity to cooperate in this very specific area. Uh, I may uh, add a point. Um, I think the, the Jordanian, Israeli, and the Palestinian countries are so much intertwined that there is no imagining of having a solution without the three countries. And of course, you know, we can add Egypt and the Turkeys later, and the Middle East. But eventually, there has to be some kind of economic uh, integration uh, in the future in the East East, because they are so much, so much uh, close together now. You have, uh, as you said, uh, you know, Palestinian money in, in Israel, and, uh, you know, Israeli uh, money in the West Bank. Jordanian dinar is used in, in the West Bank. I mean, there is uh, trade between, of course, uh, Jordan and the West Bank. And so it has to be integrated at one, one point, proper, in a proper manner. And that's why, you know, there is a vision in uh, the Jordan Israel history to have these kind of projects whereby the economy can be integrated these kind of countries. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. We're just going to ask you to speak up. Yeah, just uh, yeah, use that microphone and uh, introduce yourself and help everybody out. My name is uh, Albert McKimkin. I uh, have a question for the panel. Last week I attended a meeting at American University uh, on the same topic. And at that meeting, retired General Danny Rothschild uh, surprised the audience when he was asked a question. He was asked, if this um, Palestinian bid for state that the UN succeeds, how will that uh, increase the danger of the security risk to Israel? And his answer was that Israeli intelligence and PA security officials have been cooperating for many years uh, through difficult and less difficult times, and he didn't think that would change at all. I wonder if you share his, um, his optimism. Please. The, 
cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, particularly on the, on the security fields, was very, very close and developed until the last week. And it might continue in the near future because both, both regimes do not have an interest for a wave of violence. Just one example. A week ago, before the, a week before the, the discussion at the UN, the Palestinian authorities bought from Israel a new non-lethal weapons. And the Israeli authorities gave it to them open-handed because the interest of both sides was to prevent violence. Both understood that violence will not work for either the interest of the Palestinian Authority nor for, for Israel. So that, I guess that that will continue. This is what General Rothschild uh, referred to. But if things deteriorate, it could have definitely a very negative impact on the, on the relationship between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. I think one, one thing that could help uh, undermine uh, the situation, I, I agree with what uh, Professor Perry just said, is if Congress cuts off a, I think it would be a serious mistake, uh, and what it will do is reverse the kind of economic growth that we've just been talking about. So instead of young men going to work, they will have other things to do, which is to riot, cause violence, provoke reactions, and then you can see a downward spiral. So uh, it's very, I, I know how strongly people on the Hill feel about uh, the, the linkage between aid and what the Palestinians are doing in the UN, uh, but frankly, if they were to react in a knee-jerk way, uh, the consequences could be very severe. In the narrow situation, important situation you've outlined, I would suggest key will be the Israeli reaction, what we diplomats call the shape of the table of the prudential question. When the two, after the event, we talk about what happens, and they meet, and the Palestinians show up with name plates and cards that say, Colonel so-and-so, Republic of Palestine, do the Israelis accept that or reject it? So it will all depend, in this case, the Palestinians will be the demandeurs, and will be up to the Israelis to continue to First of all, by accepting the credentials of people, credentials of someone who tend to be the representatives of the established state. Yeah, in the back. I'm Rafi Danziger, I'm now advisor to APAC. And uh, Dov said, if I'm getting correctly, uh, that uh, for the Palestinians to go to the ICJ, National Court of Justice, or ICC, National Court of Justice, would actually be counterproductive because Israelis were not negotiating with people who called the criminals. And actually, Mahmoud Abbas in his uh, mail of the New York Times said it's exactly the purpose of becoming a state so that they could go to the ICJ, continue the legal struggle against Israel. So we'd like to hear, if possible, Mahmoud and uh, Norm uh, comment on that statement by Mahmoud Abbas. Well, uh, you know, with regard to the ICJ, they don't need really to be a state to go to the ICJ. In 2004, uh, the General Assembly also uh, you know, sent the question about the legality of building of, of a war uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory. And, uh, you know, we all know what happened. 14 to 1, the, the decision was in favor of the Palestinians. Uh, and that the war is a collateral measure which undermines self-determination and the future prospects of peace and peace. So they don't need, really need that uh, to. With regard to the ICC, uh, it's, it's a, the, the, this is a complicated matter. It's not a straightforward uh, issue. Uh, from a political perspective, uh, they have to decide on, 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 on this matter and how to proceed forward. Uh, one uh, I've worked on the ICC matters before. The ICC is intended to protect uh, the rights of people. You are a human being and your rights are being violated and you're in war or you have conflict or you're in peace. This is one of the purposes of the ICC is to protect you as an individual from any person who uh, violates your rights and you know, in, in his or her state, that person was unconscious. 
so I cannot speak on behalf of the Palestinians with regard to the, uh, to the ICC, but it is a matter for uh, them to decide, to taking everything uh, into <coughs> account. Uh, Though there are very many opinions on every issue in Israel, on some issues there is almost unanimity. And one of them is the anti-Israel bias of the UN General Assembly or institutions like the ICC. Uh, Abba Ibn used to say, you mentioned Abba Ibn before, he used to say, and now Netanyahu repeats that, that if there will be a, a motion to the UN that the, the earth is flat, automatically there will be 100 or 90 votes, votes for that resolution if it, come from, if it comes from any of the Arab states. And the same applies to the ICC. The Israelis do not see the ICC as an objective, neutral, moral institution, but as a playground for political interests. And there were very many cases where the Israelis felt that uh, they were, it was proven so. And therefore, the mere decision or the mere pronunciation of Mahmoud Abbas, that they will move, they will use these means, is being seen by the Israelis as, an, as a hint that we are not going to negotiate as serious partners, but we are going to out, outflank you in fields where you are very weak. Yes, right here. <clears throat> well, Milton Honig. Well, repeatedly you hear the statement, this is the last chance for a two-state solution. So what does that mean? And isn't the two-state solution the only alternative in the long run? Yes, what does that mean? I can answer if you want. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, both, the, both politically and theoretically. And a colleague of ours, Ian Lustig, wrote a book uh, 15 years ago in which he looked into the, the, uh, the, 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 issue, the question of when does, when does a state can withdraw from another territory that it occupied, and when it cannot do it anymore? And he took some cases, the, the French in, in Algeria, the British in, in Ireland, and Israel in the West Bank. And he has a, a very interesting theoretical model to say when you reach a stage where you cannot withdraw anymore, and, 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 and the new territory is being really squeezed become integral part of, of, of the uh, metropolitan. When he wrote the book then, he, he was sure that Israel will be able to withdraw from the territories. After 15 or 17 years since he wrote his book, now he believes that it will be much more difficult for Israel to do so. Namely, that Israel has reached the stage of no return. It will be very difficult, according to him, to withdraw from the territories. I beg to differ. I believe that if there is a political will by, by, by the partners, a two-state solution can be achieved. After all, we know the parameters that were put on the table by President Clinton and were reiterated by different negotiators. The last ones were Prime Minister Ormel and, 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 and uh, President uh, Abu Mazan. They have almost agreed about the, ter the, the territorial issue. The question was whether it would be 2% two, two more here or there. So I believe that the major issue is not the territories, it's the political will. Mr. Bastion. Despite what I said in my prepared remarks about the essential relevance historically in the present of outsiders, I'd like to suggest, given the question, that this situation offered an opportunity for an outsider. That was the United States. Because of a phrase in this town popular a little while ago, but never got a good crisis, go to waste. We have missed a chance here. What if, shortly after the Palestinians announced their decision of going to the UN, the United States had tabled a resolution in the Security Council calling for Palestinian statehood on the basis of the, of the details of the last accord that was almost signed but never? What if we put that reservation on the table in the Security Council? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I, I guess uh, I also see it as an opportunity, um, and I agree with Professor Perry. Uh, until the Security Council has to vote, the opportunity is still there. Uh, some wag said that the real mistake the Israelis made was when Abu Mazen put his proposal forward. They should have said, great, 
we support you, and then he would have withdrawn it. Um, but, but seriously, uh, the opportunity exists. And in terms of, of, uh, of the, the, the settlers, I mean, obviously, uh, the more settlements, the more outposts that become settlements, the more settlements that become cities, and that's what most of them really are. They're not settlements. They're cities, if you've seen them. Uh, they're as big as American small towns, and sometimes even bigger. The longer that goes on, the more difficult it gets. But the parameters of the, uh, the last Camp David try still pretty much hold, and that's why I said in my remarks at the podium, the Palestinians are focusing on the wrong thing. By focusing on all settlements, on every bit of construction, which frankly the administration opened the door for them to do, they've rendered it impossible for Netanyahu to follow, to follow up that way. Because again, if somebody has a baby, they want to build a bedroom, all of a sudden they're creating new settlements. On the other hand, if they were to say, we want a commitment, no outposts at all, no new outposts, uh, no expansion territorially, that's a very different story. And uh, if that were to happen, say, today, I think a deal would still be possible in terms of land exchanges. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very important question, and I've tried to answer it. The more uh, settlements that are being built, and since the Oslo Accords, this number has tripled and quadrupled, the number of settlements and, and settlers. There wouldn't be a chance to have Palestinians. It would be pockets of concentration of Palestinians here and there in the West Bank without no any territorial uh, contigu contiguity at the same time to build a state. A state is like a human being. It grows up. It has to have elements for it to become a state. If you don't have that, there will be no state. If you don't have a state, then it is one state solution. And it is Israel. So for those who would think, you know, uh, it is a threat. It is one state and it is Israel. Then Israel has to decide what kind of state do we have to have one state. By the way, we're not taking more refugees in Jordan. That's that's it. Jordan is, is, is Jordan. But what happens then? You have within in the next few years the number on, in historic Palestine of Jews and Arabs will be the same. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna have an apartheid state? Or are you gonna have a Jewish state? Or a democratic state. That's the question Israel has. And how to decide, and time is not on this side. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes, uh, last week, my name is George Pick. Uh, last week, Mr. Erekat gave an interview to Charlie Rose, and right after that, the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations gave him a, a, uh, an interview. Mr. Erekat said that he has maps already, which I assume are the basis for what the Palestinians want as a <coughs> state. But he said that he needs to hear just a number from the Israelis before he can sit down with them unequivocally, 1967. That's what he wants to hear. The Israeli ambassador said, I just want to hear one sentence, which is two states for two people, and we would sit down. Now, is this just a bluff, or is this real, or is this just a show? And my question is, when the Palestinians want a state, a state usually is associated historically with a territory. So they had to have some sort of a map, which they showed to the international community of this. Did they or didn't they? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I haven't, I haven't heard uh, this issue before. But again, uh, you know, the parameters for settlement are well, well known. And they are uh, very similar to that that was proposed by uh, President Clinton uh, in, in 2000. I don't think it will, it will change. Uh, much uh, from that. Everybody knows how the solution is going to be. But the thing is that people should not say, well, if I will delay for a day or two or ten the negotiations, that I will gain more. It, it won't happen. You, you will not. You will be sorry to say that term, but you will be shooting yourself in the foot as well as the same people. Any, anyone else? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, I am Jacob Rudler, and just wanted to ask in general, I'm a little surprised that no one's covered the status of the city of Jerusalem as it is a contentious issue regarding the whole process, particularly the settlements in the eastern part of the city, and also for Mr. Kamud. And you were talking about earlier that how the state needs its own security, government, and territory, and people. Well, I, the a general understanding I have is that Gaza would also be included in a potential Palestinian state, but yet there is two separate governments right now, so how would that work, especially in the current UN bid situation? If there's two governments, so you need to make two Palestinian states, well, one Palestinian state with divided government, and you know, no one really knows there is no true sovereignty by the Palestinian Authority under Abbas or the Hamas government. How would that work? Uh, th that's another thing uh, which is a lateral measure taken. Uh, sorry, by Mr. Sharon at that time. We draw without an agreement, and that was the consequence. Uh, Mr. Sharon said no agreement with the Tony, and that's, that's it. And that's, that's a big problem. That's why you need to negotiate the solution. But you are absolutely right. Uh, this is a big problem. And since uh, Hamas took over Gaza, this is probably, and in my opinion, the thorniest issue with regard to finding a solution, a comprehensive solution to the Arab Israeli conflict. What, <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that you can't negotiate. You, can't negotiate. you have to find a basis for uh, a solution. And the basis has already been, over the years, has been created. Everybody knows the Arabs. You can start from that. And then you, you worry about Gaza. And let's, let's see first if we can have some framework for an agreement that we can work on. And then, without giving too much details on this issue, Gaza will eventually be resolved. What it would be then a peripheral problem, not the main problem, if we have a framework for an agreement. One, one has to look at the negotiations that took place already in the late 80s. 1980. We're not starting to negotiate today. The Quartet asked both sides to put forward their position within the next three months. We know what the positions are. They were negotiated. They were very close to an agreement several times. So some of the questions are really irrelevant at all. The question of the borders are almost, I would dare say, irrelevant. We know that Israel is going to give back if there is an agreement between 95 to 98 percentage of the territories. And we know that both, most of the, of the settlements, most of the, of, of the settlers, will remain in the 2 or 3 percent that will be annexed to Israel. So neither the issue of the borders, nor the issue of the settlements, or the Israeli settlers, is a real problem. Without that, there will be no agreement. There are some issues that were left open. Here I can be less sure, but I believe that uh, intelligent diplomats or politicians know the answer as well. And that, that, that includes both issues, Jerusalem and the refugees. Israel will have to give up its demand that there will be no Palestinian capital in Jerusalem. The Palestinians will have to give up their demand that refugees will go back to Israel. This, is the, this will be the historical compromise. Without that, there will be no solution. What is left are new issues that have been raised lately, and they have to be solved. For example, the security issues. And indeed, the Israelis were asked now to present the security demands. Because with the changes in the Middle East, what will be the future of the uh, Jordan Valley? In the past, the Israelis were more lenient on that. Today, they are they're less so, and rightly so. Because if there will be change in Jordan, if the, the American influence in Iraq will diminish, the probability of attacking Israel from the east is much more likely today than it was 10 years ago. So the Israelis will demand much, probably will demand a permanent position of the Israeli military of the Jordan River, something which the Palestinians will not agree. And there are some other new elements which will be discussed. But the basic parameters are known. We are wasting our time talking about it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, please, Rob. Uh, Don Wallace, I've got a question for Professor Perry and one for Ambassador Marks. First question is to you, Professor. You say the issue is political will. Uh, the political will of the Netanyahu administration 
I'd be curious for your true observations on what that will is. And then the question of Ambassador Marx is this. Others have said that the United States should have, in a sense, welcomed this opportunity to have gone to the Security Council and, in a sense, not be automatically negative to the Palestinian initiative. Um, do you think that's realistic, given the issue of political will in the Netanyahu administration and our relationship with it? I don't follow you. I said we should. I suppose we should have uh, used the opportunity, but under specific conditions. I don't mean just putting forward a resolution that says it's Palestinian statehood. Putting forward one which which encapsulates the last agreed, last negotiated agreement in all details before it was rejected. Now, there were still a couple points that weren't accepted on that. So what? Put it in the UN Security Council, and then let's negotiate in the Security Council with the United States, remember, still holding a veto if it all goes really awry, if it gets really out of hand. And then you force the two parties in the Security Council to negotiate that little bit of difference, which is significant, but still there. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but you completely preempt the Palestinian request for a statehood without these defined questions, which seems to bother everybody. You put on the question, statehood under these conditions. You guys want it? Negotiate. This is one of the most difficult questions for every any Israeli analyst. What is what does really Netanyahu what does he have very deeply in his heart or in his head? And that is because Netanyahu Netanyahu's political political makeup is complicated. On one hand, he is the son of his father, and he is the husband of his wife, Boy. and and he is the father of his son. All three will never give back the West Bank to the Palestinians to make peace. On the other hand, he is a very clever, shrewd politician who understands world reality and understands the constraints on Israel. And he understands that there is a gap between the beliefs and dreams and reality. And he's very pragmatic. So which part of his personality will be stronger depends on the political game. This is the reason why President Perez, for example, changed his position in the last two years vis-a-vis -vis Netanyahu three or four times. Whenever Netanyahu met with President Perez, he told him, I'm going to make peace. And you'll be surprised how much I'm willing to compromise. And then, other times, Perez said he doesn't seem that he's going to do so. I believe that at the end of the day, it will not be what is in his heart, but what will be in his mind. And the way he reads the international situation, the forces outside Israel, the forces within Israel. I'll give you just one example. The Labour Party, I'm not a great fan of the Labour Party anymore, but the Labour Party won a fantastic victory last week when they new, elected a new, a new leader. The public, the public opinion polls gave the party in the next election 22 seats instead of the less than 10 that they have today. If there will be a change in the in next year and a half elections in Israel, it won't be a major change, but you need only three, four seats to move from the right to the left. That will enable Netanyahu, who will probably be re-elected, to establish a different coalition. If he has a different coalition, not with the extreme parties on the right, but with some moderate parties on the left, it would, might be easier for him to move towards compromise. The same applies for, for pressure from the outside world. So you cannot, no one can give you an answer because there is no answer. It depends what will be the nature of the game in the future. Mr. Basham. I may be supposed to get involved in Israeli internal politics, but another subject which I don't know much. I know nothing about it, nothing talk, nothing about it and what he's like, but there are two things that have happened in Israel the last 20 years or so, which he is, after all, an elected leader in a democracy. Both these developments illustrate that the prime rule of the universe still works, and that's the rule of unintended consequences. The engagement in Israel of the American evangelical community, welcomed for lots of reasons by the Israeli government and population, given the perspective of the evangelical community, fairly hard right, fairly conservative, has helped push the Israeli body politic more to the right. 
the arrival in Israel of, over, of about a million Russian citizens, allegedly Jewish, who have turned out to be Soviet Russian types in terms of their political views and their social attitudes, has also significantly shifted the center of balance of the Israeli politics, center of the Israeli polity to the right. So these have shifted and changed the perspective of the Israeli public position, and that is, after all, an elected leader. One more, I think I've got to get some comment. One, no, no, just one more sentence. And don't forget the million young voters, the millennialists. The millennialists who, got, who gave Obama the victory gave Netanyahu the victory as well. But the reason is very simple. They were so, socialized politically during the 10 years after the breakdown of the Oslo Agreement of the year 2000 with the second intifada with suicidal attacks in Israel when they cannot go to the pubs to drink because there are, there are, there are bombs there, when they cannot go to the university because there are bombs on, 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 on buses, where they know that Israel withdrew from North Lebanon, South Lebanon and the Hezbollah continued to shell Israeli cities, when they saw Prime Minister Sharon withdraw, withdraw from Gaza and yet the Hezbollah continued, the, the Hamas continued to attack <coughs> civilians in the south. So these million people moved dramatically to the right, and it would be a miracle had they not done so, watching what happened in these 10 years ago. We have time for one quick question and a quicker answer. <laughs> yeah, no, right back here. Hi, uh, my name is Evan Lund. I uh, work here at ICTS. Uh, my question is this. Uh, given that uh, recently violence has occurred in, uh, in Israel, and with the spirit of the, uh, the Arab Spring, do you think that a failure of, um, of this recent attempt by Palestine to become a state could result in even more violence and ultimately perhaps even a third Palestinian intifada? Do you think that uh, many leaders are considering that and that's playing a role in, uh, in the international discussion? Who's got a quick answer? Uh, okay. Well, uh, it's not about the uh, issue of Failure because it's basically, you know, you're going to Security Council seeking full membership in the UN. There's many other uh, alternatives uh, for, for the, they might eventually get it. I mean, they have procedure in the United for peace resolution where that they can go through, straight to the General Assembly on this, or they can be uh, 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 like the Vatican, uh, non member state. There's alternative that I'm now discussing with the, with the UN that might happen. But I, I, I frankly think it, uh, it depends on the Israelis and the Palestinians and how much uh, they try to cooperate and try to defuse any kind of tension that would, would, uh, would ensue uh, in this regard. The uh, security cooperation has been going well. That's why there is no uh, major incidents in the past few years coming from the West Bank. And that's that's uh, uh, very <coughs> important. Uh, basically, that's that's. Okay, well, I want to, uh, on behalf of uh, Mike Schwetman and, of course, uh, Professor Alexander, I want to thank our distinguished panel for uh, just a super, super uh, series of presentations and, and responses to the questions. And I, I'll wrap it up. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. It has nothing to do with Israel or Palestine, but it has a little bit to do with negotiations. When we were uh, when we were discussing uh, things with the former Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact in our country and strategic arms reductions and what led really to uh, the end of the so-called Cold War, I remember we hosted Professor uh, General Akramayov, who was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the Soviet Union and the most influential uh, military person in the Soviet Union. And when he uh, when he threw his weight behind. Uh, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, that made the difference. And so we were hosting him at Camp Lejeune. And uh, amongst other things, he said, uh, he asked one of our corporals, he said, uh, what do you think about uh, we uh, Russians being here? And uh, what do you think about that? And why do you think we're here? And the corporal said, uh, looked him in the eye and said, uh, I don't know why you're here, Marshal, but it sounds like a pretty good idea. And what the corporal meant, of course, was that uh, you got to, it's far better to talk 
and to negotiate than it is running around saying you're going to do this and do that. Uh, you're never going to get anywhere with the latter. You may or may not be successful with the former, but it's worth a hell of a try. And it's, uh, it's obvious to me that this is a very complex uh, issue, of course, as we all know. But I personally uh, uh, think that it has to be uh, uh, solved through negotiations uh, by the Israelis and the Palestinians in order to work. I don't see any other way to do it. And the worst thing of all would be to have third and fourth parties uh, representing them. So thank you all very much.